about your work, I have heard from a few sources that uh, during your research here in British Columbia, you've actually jumped off a of zodiac a few times to go uh, get some seals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, marine mammals and seals uh, are excellent uh, canaries uh, to tell us stories about the state of the ocean. So when I study pollutants, I use marine mammals as scientific tools to go out and sample the food web. And when I uh, catch a seal and it's live and I can get a little blood sample and a little blubber sample, I can do measurements of the pollutants we find in them and I can also look at their health. Mm. So getting access to a good sample uh, from a uh, a seal on loan for about 20 minutes is a wonderful way to do research here in the south in British Columbia where we have ready access to these animals. That's wonderful. Well, I love your commitment to your work. <laughs> and uh, you've been studying the ocean pollution for about 25 years now, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Awesome. And I know that you've done some work up in the Arctic as well. Could you tell us a little bit about what it's like going to the Arctic? Well, uh, going to the Arctic is a treat indeed. It's, uh, it's a long way up there. It takes one to two days to get up there by air, and sometimes you're dealing with multiple flights, you're dealing with boats, you're dealing with helicopters. Um, and I've been blessed with being able to go up a couple of times for a couple of very important studies, but many times uh, we have uh, colleagues and partners and graduate students that spend more time either amongst the mosquitoes uh, or on the ice or on, the, on boats uh, in order Order to get samples to do our kind of uh, research. So I've been to both the Western Canadian Arctic and the Eastern Canadian Arctic mm. and uh, I've been uh, mesmerized by the uh, just the, the sights and sounds of, yeah. uh, of a spectacular and vast area. Well we have a photo that's up right now. Could you tell us a little bit about this area? Well, on the far northeastern tip of the continent, we have Labrador uh, and the Torngat uh, National Park, the Torngat Mountains National Park. And this is an area that is, is uh, riveting. I mean, it's an area of uh, spectacular beauty, not very much trees. We're, we're pretty much above the tree line, but these big mountains, majestic mountains with fjords, deep water fjords. Uh, we have polar bears on shore. We have seals in the water. Uh, we have whales going by, and of course in winter we have lots of ice. So, a uh, pretty spectacular area. Yeah, definitely. Well, I know you have been able to do some great work with uh, seals up in the Arctic as well. In fact, I have a photo um, of a seal on the ice, so could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, ring seals are probably the most abundant marine mammal in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, very hard to get good numbers because they don't hang out together in groups. They're basically solitary. Uh, but we would guess there to be somewhere around three to seven million uh, uh, wow. Ring seals uh, spread throughout the Arctic. They're of course dependent on ice and the and the food web that finds itself associated with ice. Uh, they have pups uh, in little uh, uh, sort of igloos, little dens uh, uh, that allow them a little bit of protection from the predators that might otherwise consume them. As a, a marine mammal, they occupy a fairly high position in the food chain, so they do get exposed to these biomagnifying mm. pollutants of concern that we're very much interested in. Most of these pollutants are coming through the air, going thousands of kilometers with impunity, dropping down onto the surface of the uh, Arctic uh, snowpack or ice or, or water, getting into the food web, and then up into the, the marine mammals. Mm. So we do worry about uh, a number of pollutants in this species. And of course, this species is food for a number of predators as well as food for Inuit people. Mm. So how has it affected the Inuit people there? Well, um, you know, it's interesting because Canada has uh, really led the way internationally to use science uh, to drive not only domestic national policy and regulations, but to drive international treaties to make the world a better place. Mm. And a really good example is the Stockholm Convention. Mm. This was signed in 2004, and it was a convention that basically acknowledged that PCBs, DDT, chlordane, dioxins, and a bunch of other chemicals are going through the atmosphere, getting into distant remote food webs, amplifying up into marine mammals and some humans uh, or human populations, and mm -hmm. this is not good. Um, and Canada uh, used groundbreaking research starting in the 1970s and 80s to provide a basis for this policy change and this treaty. So really important um, uh, to use that information, and, um, and uh, of course Canada was uh, 
yeah. right there at the table. Have you yourself tried any of the foods while you're visiting the Arctic? I have indeed. Um, you know, going into the Arctic as a as a southern scientist uh, requires a great deal of investment and patience. It's a foreign geography, landscape, climate, uh, and of course uh, many Inuit people living throughout the Arctic and have been living there for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. There's a cultural history and tradition. There's a respect for the interaction between human and, and, and ice and environment. Uh, and so you know, someone like me would be doomed without the, the, the partnership and the help and the, the learning uh, from uh, the teachers and mentors in the Arctic. So, um, so when one goes to the Arctic, one um, respects the local traditions and one tastes the local wares. So there are some interesting foods to be, uh, to be had. Yeah. Do you have any favorite moments from the studies and the, your trips up to these places in the Arctic? That's a difficult one. Um, you know, interesting, when you go into the Arctic, uh, the first shocker is the, 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 the magnitude of the landscape. Mm. You could see, you know, forever, basically. It's, it's, it's open, uh, there's no forest, there's no cover, there's no buildings. Uh, and the second thing you see are the people. You're, mm. you're, you're seeing uh, uh, vibrant communities, really uh, interesting communities uh, with a uh, strong history of uh, oral tradition and uh, culture uh, and some just remarkable people uh, living in what to, to many of us from the South would view as inhospitable. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing would be the wildlife, which you don't run into that frequently. Um, it's, um, it's, an, it's a really, really interesting place to visit. Yeah, well, there's a photo that you actually uh, provided of a village um, up in the Arctic. So would this be like what you're describing? So this is Tuktoyaktuk in the Western Arctic on the Beaufort Sea. And one would fly in here and land on a dirt runway. Uh, and we worked very closely with the Inuvialuit uh, people who uh, call this home uh, at an island just offshore here uh, where uh, there's a local annual beluga harvest. Mm. Uh, beluga muktuk, very important culturally to the community. So as scientists, we, we basically go in to, to take advantage of an opportunity to collaborate with people that know the place, know the animal, uh, are harvesting for, for food security purposes uh, and health purposes, uh, and then we are taking samples to understand more about the animal itself and its mm -hmm. place in the environment. Tuck, or tuk 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 as you can see, is uh, very low to the sea and is very vulnerable to rising sea level mm. for two reasons. One is the sea level is rising in a low community, and the other is permafrost is uh, is melting. Mm. So with all the work that you've been able to do up there and bringing that to the ocean research program here, um, how does that all tie in together? Well, at the end of the day, a lot of the, the pollutants that I study uh, know no boundaries. They, uh, they travel through the atmosphere uh, very, very easily. They move through ocean currents. They're biologically pumped, if you will, with migrations of salmon and seabirds and all the rest. Um, and it's estimated that uh, it takes anywhere from five to eight days for, for a, a pollutant hmm. to move from a, a factory in Ohio to the Arctic wow. or from a factory in China to Vancouver. So these things hmm. move very quickly into what we would otherwise call pristine remote environments. And I think it's really important for us to understand the nature of our activities and our industrial activities and our chemical regulations and practices to make sure that we aren't inadvertently contaminating uh, remote environments and putting um, uh, indigenous people in harm's way. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, are there any projects that you can tell us about that's helping to combat some of this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my wife Tanya has been working for a long time with a large team uh, in Labrador where there's a local contaminated site. Mm. Uh, a lot of PCBs were released as part of the military radar uh, station initiatives of the Cold War uh, and that was uh, accidental but there's a big PCB contaminated hotspot in Labrador and uh, the Canadian government uh, is working with a number of partners to, to understand that, document it uh, and clean it up. So that's, that is a story about research in action focused in on a hot spot to clean things up so the local food webs are safer for the local Inuit. Mm -hmm. The other example is simply looking at the Beluga and the Beaufort Sea and understanding what they're telling us about global pollutants, whether they're PCBs that we banned in 1975 or PBDEs that were only banned just a few years ago in Canada. So uh, by 
carrying out studies in these two marine mammals, we can, we can tell some really important stories that I think uh, point the way towards solutions sometimes not easy solutions, but really important solutions for the people of the Arctic. Yeah, that's wonderful. And is there anything that uh, we can look forward to coming next from you? Well, the Arctic continues to be a, a, a hot topic, uh, excuse the, pl the pun, uh, climate change looms large, uh, but we are concerned about uh, pollutants interacting with the changing climate. So mm -hmm. those are two big threats on the horizon uh, in the Arctic. Some of the pollutant threats are diminishing, climate threats are increasing. We will continue to work on uh, marine mammals in the Arctic uh, so that we can provide science and support of, uh, as we discussed, uh, good responsible policies that help to protect mm -hmm. and preserve uh, Arctic uh, wildlife and uh, way of life for the Inuit. That's wonderful. Well, I'm so glad you're out there helping uh, that good fight and uh, with us here at the Vancouver Aquarium as well. And unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our talk show. But thank you so much again, Dr. Peter Ross, for joining us. Uh, for those of you that are watching from home, if you would like to see more of the Northern Spotlights talk shows, you can go on the Vancouver Aquarium YouTube page. They're all there. And if you like more information on what exactly the Vancouver Aquarium is doing, you can visit our website, vanaqua.org slash our north to find out more information. Uh, again, my name is Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs>